Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for our Leaders Initiative seminar series. Our speaker today is Dr. Sharia Robinson Lane, who will present Health, Coping, and Family Caregiving, examining the support needs of family caregivers. Dr. Robinson Lane is an assistant professor at the University of Michigan School of Nursing, and her work aims to reduce health disparities and improve health equity for diverse older adults and family caregivers managing pain and chronic diseases such as Alzheimer's. Without further ado, welcome Dr. Robinson Lane. Hello, everybody. Um, I see so many folks I know, so um, I hope that um, this will be more of a um, conversation than a um, lecture per se, and we should have plenty of times for questions, or if you have questions as we go along, please feel free to um, engage. Um, I've been thankful to have quite a lot of support, um, you know, since I've been here from different organizations, including National Institute on Aging, um, Michigan Medicine, School of Nursing, um, Veterans Affairs, Procter and Gamble, and I believe also NINR has funded some of the work that we've been able to do related to family caregiving. My program of research is really centered around equitable care delivery for older adults and care that promotes quality of life and aging in place. And one of the questions that tends to come up frequently is around exactly what aging in place means. And aging in place has a lot of different definitions, but essentially it's these three things that are listed here. It's the capacity and desire of older adults to be able to remain in their homes that they're living in, to stay within that community. Um, it, later can evolve to the need to be able to relocate for increased social support and access to care. So that might mean that you're getting older um, and then you decide um, that it's nice to be closer to where your kids and people who love you can help you as you need help. Um, that still is considered aging in place. Um, and then ultimately for some, it just means avoiding or ultimately delaying the nursing home placement because the reality is, is that um, somewhere over 75%, I think it's closer to 80 or 90, um, older adults at some point are going to require outside um, care and support related to disabilities that are secondary to um, end-stage types of chronic diseases. And most of us, um, middle-aged and older adults, are not really thinking about the sorts of things that we need to have in place in order to um, be where we want to be as we grow older. And so when we look at the things that need to be in place for that to happen, um, usually it's like these five different areas are the core components of aging in place. So one are the individual health needs. So what are the health conditions that you have as an individual that you need to be able to adapt to, to adjust to, and to figure out how to manage well, um, and to do that as independently as possible in order to stay where you are. The second piece is thinking about your personal community and your um, environment. So um, are there ways of coping that you have to be able to figure out? Are there things that you have to adjust within your own house so that you can stay there? Um, meaning, is it accessible for you if you have a physical disability? Are there things to help you to remind you to do things if it's a cognitive disability? So what are the sorts of uh, stuff in your immediate or home or community environment that makes it easier for you to reside there. Even something simple as having sidewalks in your neighborhood um, so that you can get around if you need to use an assistive device or having uneven sidewalks that makes it easier or less difficult if you're using like a walker, cane, wheelchair, anything like that, or even just walking. And maybe you can't pick up your feet in the way that you used to. And um, the way that your outside is designed makes it more easy for you to uh, fall or the streets aren't well lit. All these things contribute to this, um, these environmental concerns that make a difference for how we age. Then of course is the social networks. These can be um, relatives and people that you're actually related to or the family that you have chosen, um, whether it's church family or uh, neighbors people that are willing to um, look in and look out for you and that you do the same for them so that when times of need arise, you can rely on these social networks, both for emotional, um, social, spiritual, and emotional support, but sometimes even the um, physical support needs that can arise from dealing with um, chronic disease and um, illness. 
Interestingly, we know from the literature that uh, certain groups are more likely to have to rely upon non-relatives uh, as part of these uh, social networks. This occurs more commonly with minorities, as well as individuals that are a part of the LGBTQIA um, community, which then, you know, as we'll see, is also related to family caregiving because you tend to see uh, less uh, relatives or uh, blood relatives um, within these other groups compared to a uh, majority white groups, non-Hispanic. The other things that make a difference are the available community services. And so if you live in a rural versus a metropolitan area, there's going to be some variances in what sorts of services are available. And just across counties, there's a large difference in um, what sorts of support individuals are um, able to um, access, who can um, um, attend, like the physicality, like how easy it is to get to um, various places. And of course, of course, you know, we're still in the midst of the, a pandemic. And so there have been changes to programming and restrictions that are secondary to the pandemic that has changed both um, the ways the individual are able to connect socially with other individuals, as well as just the availability of some of the community services. And then the final piece here are the relevant policies that um, support um, individuals being able to age in place. So for example, um, what sorts of funding is available to create modifications to your home environment so that you can stay there? And what sorts of funds, like how, can you use your retirement funds for something like that? Or would you be penalized for using retirement funds uh, for something like that? How, what funds and um, policies support um, having care in the home or getting other sorts of things that you might need? Like, for example, having a... Um, uh, someone to help in the, to assist like with laundry or cleaning, which isn't something that, you know, most people tend to think about as a luxury until you're not able to navigate the stairs, maybe to get to your basement easily to do your clothes, or you don't have transportation readily available um, and can't physically carry your laundry to, um, you know, go to a laundromat or something else. And so, uh, so policy also makes a difference in um, what sorts of services are available in which communities how funds are used and how they may be used and all of this sort of plays together in this um, whole idea around aging in place. Much of my work has centered more squarely around the social networks, which is where family caregiving comes in. And then this area of uh, the individual health needs, which has to do with how individuals uh, personally adapt to their changes in health. When we talk about family caregivers, the main sorts of tasks that we see individuals um, doing are listed here and broken up into instrumental activities of daily living, as well as the general activities of daily living. Most of the time when people think about family caregiving, I think we tend to focus on the uh, physical, when there's more physical needs of the individual. So helping people to physically get out of their bed, um, getting dressed, um, toileting, feeding, showering, that type of thing. But it's the instrumental activities of daily living that we found that create significant amounts of um, stress to um, families. Um, and it's also stressful in many instances to the individual that might uh, be living with uh, dementia because at this point, many of them still are um, aware that they're having some struggles. They're aware of the uh, strain that it might be causing within relationships. Um, and so it can be, it's challenging to the family unit as a whole. And so some of these types of activities that we don't really think about as caregiving might be taking somebody shopping because they can't get to the store as frequently. And so we regularly go pick them up to go get groceries or to go on a shopping trip, um, picking somebody up to go to their medical appointments consistently, um, helping them to make sure that their bills get paid or setting up the auto pay. Uh, for them, taking them to the bank and helping them with their banking and figuring out these sorts of things. And then, you know, the laundry, the housework, and perhaps either setting up medications for the week or ordering and making sure they have their medications or all different types of assistance that we might see. When we look at um, caregivers of persons who are 50 and older, we know that there's, you know, almost 42 million caregivers of persons who are over 50. But caregiving isn't just limited to 
um, individuals who are older adults, we have caregiving across the lifespan. You have parents who are caring for children um, for with um, chronic diseases, illnesses, developmental disabilities. Um, and then in that, you also have um, individuals who are caring for older adults. And so the other thing about caregiving that sometimes individuals don't, we don't really think about is that caregiving isn't always time limited. And that's one of the things I think caregivers don't realize either is that they go in thinking that they're there for a time limited, you know, maybe a few weeks, a few months. And um, there really isn't a definitive end time, um, sometimes until that person, you know, you anticipate whether or not they may pass away. And the question is, you know, can you do it for that length of time? And then what sorts of supports do you need in order to uh, be able to maintain as a caregiver and fall into this sort of new way of having to engage with the individual, uh, which is also affected by your relationship with that person, right? It can look very different being a caregiver of, say, a child um, and that long-term commitment to caring for a child with a particular type of disability that requires support then it might be a neighbor who you started off sort of helping. Um, you've been engaged, but like now maybe you are able to um, disconnect, but there's a different sort, sort of sense of obligation um, in that sort of a relationship or being a spouse as a caregiver and what that might feel like for an individual as compared to being a child or a granddaughter. And so all of these different dynamics can affect the caregiving relationship. There's also non-traditional caregivers that are part of this that often are forgotten in these spaces. About 6% of caregivers for older uh, adults are um, children and about 10% are neighbors and friends. And just as a reminder, this often is more likely to occur within um, groups of minorities <clears throat> where you tend to have large extended families that are more likely to be residing um, together. Um, as well as in um, group within groups of individuals um, that are part of the LGBTQIA um, community who may not have the same sort of kinship relationships of individuals that they can rely upon um, in times of need. So that means when we're thinking about how to best support family caregivers, one, we got to make sure that our definition of family is okay and that it's inclusive of the definition I like to use is the definition that we use in the life care and the hospice care, which is family is who you say it is. And so from a practical standpoint, sometimes that's easy to do when it's some of our research and our programming where we want to be able to reach whoever is providing care. And in some instances, that's really not practical when it means, for example, being able to get FMLA time from work and you're caring for your neighbor, but Technically, that's not family. So now your job doesn't want to give you time off to care for your neighbor. You know, not even FMLA, you might not even be able to get bereavement time for, you know, somebody that isn't, you know, um, noted as a blood relative, unless you can somehow prove that this is somebody that you love and care for and have been um, supporting. And so that's where, again, some of the policy stuff sort of comes in to really start to think more broadly about who are these social networks that individuals are connected to and how as a community and as a society do we best um, support all of these individuals. The other piece that gets missed sometimes with these non-traditional caregivers is that particularly with the children, we don't really think about training and we really don't think about how these individuals are caregivers. And so when you look at the same list that we showed before, of the types of um, activities that um, caregivers will be participating in. The ones that you see highlighted here are the sorts of activities that you might have a child or a teenager, right, assist with. I say teenager, because sometimes when you think about children, you think about small children instead of just, you know, it could be you sent your teen over there to help a relative or a family member or left them at home, you know, to help with grandma. But nobody would think twice about, you know, um, having somebody assist with feeding to go in and um, put their plate in the microwave, heat their food up, and then go and make sure she eats. Or if somebody's no longer able to feed themselves, go in there and sit and feed grandma, make sure you don't go too fast. These are the sorts of directions that we give to um, kids. And we don't really, we aren't really thoughtful about telling them like what to expect, like what happens if she spits it back out or if they're pushing it 
you know, away and how long should you attempt to feed and all of these sort of um, nuances that can make a difference in the quality of life for the individual that's needed support. And that can really cause a lot of stress to the um, young adult or young teenager or kid that might be assisted in care that really isn't for sure about how to, uh, what to expect, or even if they're really um, doing it right. And so the other thing to remember is that even if when we're outside of children, caregiving and caregivers typically don't get the opportunity to really um, know that they're going to have this responsibility of providing care for somebody. It often comes up um, uh, uh, quickly out of the blue. Um, sometimes it's after uh, um, illness like COVID, somebody comes out of the hospital and now they need a caregiver and now you have to figure it out or they've had a stroke. Or even in the case of dementia, it may be that you started recognizing that there's challenges with this individual, but you still haven't had the opportunity to sort of wrap your mind around the fact that you're going to have to support this person in a substantive way. And when there's a um, shared relationship, such as that of spouses, that some of the dynamics of how um, jobs were shared within that relationship, whether it's household tasks, emotional tasks, et cetera, that that also is going to change. And there has to be some adaptations to the relationship as a result of um, these new responsibilities. So that changes the caregiver and patient, meaning the person who is needing care, their relationship. And so we know it's true is that inadequately prepared caregivers really leads to both poor patient and family outcomes. Not only, as we mentioned, can you have um, um, poor quality of life for the person receiving care, um, but it can be very uh, stressful for the person that's giving care. They can not prioritize their own health, which can cause declines um, in their health. Um, and so it can be a very challenging situation for the family. And so this is where there is the need for um, support of community organizations, of um, support programs that individuals can rely upon to get both information and to be able to be validated as um, caregivers that they're doing a good job, how they can maybe do a little bit better, and to have an opportunity to just vent about the um, stress, the strain, the burden um, of the experience. When we look at prevalence across the lifespan, um, one of the things that's interesting is um, that we see that there are differences in who is providing care for persons. Um, this is across the lifespan, so not just for older adults. And one of the things that's interesting, you see that Black caregivers um, are, have a very high prevalence of caregiving um, across the lifespan. And one of the reasons for this that's quite fascinating, um, and we don't have Indigenous persons on here, is that when we in a study now are looking at um, the poll on healthy aging, which um, examines um, older adults, middle and older age adults, and um, provides a nationally representative sample of these individuals. Uh, we just recently did a poll on preparedness for aging in place. And one of the things that's really fascinating about these groups is that there's a really high incidence of disability amongst Black and particularly Latino and indigenous persons, which you know often they get dropped from samples because they tend to have such small numbers compared to the rest of the sample. And so this incidence of disability really can play a large role on then if you're looking at who's gonna support you when you have a disability, if you're still community living, more often than not, it's going to be family or people that's close to you. And so that's likely the reason that we see such a high level of um, caregiving within these groups across the lifespan. And as we continue to see uh, increasingly aging and um, diverse group of older adults, we're going to see increasing numbers of um, non-white caregivers needing support and looking for culturally responsive, accessible um, resources in order to be able to adequately do that, as well as what we call intergenerational um, support or being able to have support resources that are able to uh, be used within um, across the lifespan. So materials that are suitable for kids and that are suitable for young adults that are also as suitable for a person that is another older adult that's caring for their spouse. And thinking about how can we either create standard materials that are suitable for all of these groups or 
how do we make sure that we have different buckets of materials that can address these needs across families? So a large issue here is that dementia caregiving when compared to other types of caregiving, meaning individuals who perhaps have had a stroke or they've had a um, traumatic brain injury or they have just had some type of an accident that has left them paralyzed and need some support or even having a developmental disability um, compared to other types of caregiving, dementia family caregiving is associated with the most negative out health outcomes compared to other types of caregiving. One thing that I'm really um, also interested in in the future is that there's, all, um, interestingly, a lot of parallels between family caregiving of um, children with um, behavioral um, disabilities and mental health issues that are um, similar to some of the um, behavioral concerns that family caregivers of older adults with dementia have. And so I suspect that if this other group were brought in, we would also see parallels between the experiences of family caregivers of both of the groups because of the sorts of behaviors, the changes in um, the uh, social networks and the stress that's related um, to these different types of uh, caregiving caregivers. So the goal of my work has a, a large part of it in thinking about how to help people to age in place has really been focused on how do we help family caregivers to lessen this um, these negative outcomes for them related to the caregiving um, experience. So particularly with Black family caregivers, um, which has been the focus on my work, part of the reason I focused on this particular group is that these individuals, when we think about all of those tasks of um, caregiving that we saw with the IADLs and ADLs, um, that happens more often and more of those tasks are done um, compared to other types of um, um, disease processes that you may have to care for, and particularly amongst Black and Latino families, where they're providing over 30 hours a week doing those tasks, which we refer to as high-intensity caregiving. There's very long care trajectories. Um, one of the um, paradigms that, or not paradigms, but paradoxes that we see is that even though there's different life expectancies across uh, racial and ethnic groups for a variety of reasons, that individuals um, who do develop Alzheimer's disease, which tends to occur um, uh, for individuals who are um, much older, um, they tend to live for a while. They, they, they tend to um, live for a, a significant period of time, which means that there's a really long care trajectory. And generally for Alzheimer's disease period, individuals are often providing care for five plus years to individuals um, who progress from um, being uh, mobile and being able to um, engage in different ways to essentially becoming um, bed bound. And that's for individuals who don't also, in addition to a dementia diagnosis, also have other um, health conditions um, such as cardiovascular disease or, um, you know, um, and uh, diabetes which means that there's an increased likelihood for these particular caregivers because um, you know, there's some hereditary risk of developing some of the same chronic health conditions that the relative had of having poor health, um, them not making time or being able to find the time to be able to um, go and take care of their appointments and to prioritize self-care. Um, there may be a risk for a future dementia diagnosis. And we know in general, these individuals are more at risk for premature death. So what I've really focused on is, so how can we think about helping individuals to more effectively adapt to the caregiving role? And the theoretical framework that I use to address this um, is the Roy adaptation model, which is essentially a stress and coping model. And so essentially what uh, Roy says is that, you know, everybody's dealing with a whole lot of stress. And she talks about three different ways that we deal with stress or three different types of stressors. The focal stimuli or focal stressor is something that's immediate and that's of immediate concern. Um, and so for a person that's a new family caregiver, that a fair family caregiver, that might be their primary concern that they're trying to figure out is <clears throat> how do I deal with all of these new responsibilities now that I'm a a caregiver? Um, how do I go to work still? How do I make an income? That's focal. The contextual stress that they're also dealing with is all of the stuff that they had to figure out before. 
Maybe they also had their own health that they were worried about. So a particular chronic health condition that maybe they're not as concerned with. Maybe they also are um, double duty or triple duty caregivers where they have children that they're also responsible for caring for in addition to their spouse or their um, parent or even a grandparent that they might be um, trying to support. Maybe there's, you know, there's, so there's all sorts of other stressors that people have that are day-to-day -day stressors in addition to like this big thing that they have to figure out. And then there's something called residual stimuli, which is a stressor that the person is negatively influencing the individual, but they might not even be aware that that's a problem. So perhaps a person has a, a, a medical condition that they don't know is the issue that's making them more tired, but because they haven't had time to go to the doctor, they haven't been able to navigate and figure that out. Perhaps is some sort of a, um, a trauma and that dealing with this new caregiving situation is really triggering a PTSD type of response in them. And they don't understand that's why they're feeling that the, the way that they're feeling. And so what we're interested in is if you could imagine that there was a little filter on the bottom of this funnel here, the filter would be the coping processes and the ways that individual deal with all of this stuff that's coming through. And what we see is the behavior. And the positive behaviors that we want to see are behaviors that's evidence of effective coping. And so that's essentially what my work is examining is how do we get to positive coping or adaptive caregiving? And another way of looking at that um, is here, where you see the stressor is the dementia care needs, the, I don't know, is, are you guys seeing, um, uh-oh. I don't know if I drag this over here. Are you just seeing the screen or are you seeing extra stuff on the screen? Just the screen. Okay, thank you. Um, so the stressor is the dementia care needs. Um, one of the things that, one of the common models that we uh, see in this work is the Perlin model um, that looks at physical health as an outcome of um, sort of poor coping. And what I'm suggesting is that perhaps these physical health needs that um, caregivers have may moderate this relationship and may actually play a role in coping. And so one of the things that we found, for example, now is that body mass index is related to an individual's um, ability to, um, um, when we're looking at uh, caregivers specifically, for their um, how difficulty in controlling upsetting thoughts, which makes complete sense because in a caregiver relationship, the difficulty for controlling upsetting thoughts has to do with um, perhaps being angry about the situation that you're in, getting frustrated about the person, repeatedly asking um, questions over and over again, and these sorts of things. And so somebody that has found um, 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 challenges with being able to uh, control upsetting thoughts and that might deal with that by eating or not having a coping with, healthy way of coping with that through like exercise or relaxation and those sorts of things may be more likely to pick up weight. And so we can see why that relationship might make some sense there um, between um, this uh, these physical health needs. And the same thing with pain. We've also seen some, in, some evidence that individuals that have poorly managed pain also have um, poor coping. And that also makes sense because there is a pain and depressive cycle in which individuals that have unmet pain needs also are highly correlated with um, uh, depression. And there's a cycle between, you know, you're depressed and then because of the depression, the um, pain needs aren't really getting met effectively. And some of the treatments and therapies that might be available maybe aren't utilized maximally, which means you continue to be in pain and you continue to, you know, be depressed. And so that's where the cycle sort of um, comes in, which all of that affects the capacity of individuals to be able to effectively cope. Um, and, and that's why this mediator here of the mental health comes in, because if depending upon the individual's anxiety, um, depression, all of that also can influence um, coping and how well a person can or cannot address, adjust to caregiving. Here's a picture of uh, my grandmother who um, had Alzheimer's um, disease and we cared for her for a number of years at home um, before she moved to assisted living and um, ultimately died in a uh, nursing home at 98 from Alzheimer's. 
So some of the strategies that we've been able to identify that makes a difference um, when we first looked at uh, this was a, po a chronic pain population. Um, and, and so we talk about these individual um, coping strategies, um, being able to remain positive and remain active um, helped individuals to deal with a moderate to severe daily pain. And one of the really most fascinating things was the capacity of these individuals to stay engaged within the community despite having pretty significant uh, pain that affected their often their mobility um, and so many different aspects of their life. But by staying engaged and feeling like they were a part of something, it really kept them um, motivated. And this is really what sort of inspired um, a good part of the caregiving work besides you know, personal experience was that part of this engagement that these individuals who were living with pain had was in being care a caregiver. They really, that was a part of their engagement with the community. Um, their uh, religiosity also made a difference, um, being able to pray and meditate and then just maintaining a positive support system. And they really emphasized um, like how important it is to be thoughtful about the people that you keep around you. Um, it made a point of talking about negative individuals and you know the power of words and how powerful and what a difference it makes to be to um, be around negativity and to be really intentional about creating the positive support um, environments. When we looked more specifically at uh, family caregivers, um, uh, we also saw spirituality as another theme that was still there, but was also interesting is that people pulled a lot from their past experiences. And so if they had another relative or they remember their mother um, caring for somebody with um, dementia, this is what they really drew upon in order to provide optimal care for um, that next person, as well as gathering as much information as they um, could. And um, that's something that really also stood out to me as I thought about our own experiences with caring for my grandmother. You know, our past experience was that we also, my grandmother took care of my great grandmother. And we saw the ways in which she engaged with her, how she kept her at home, um, the sorts of services that she was able to engage. And we really modeled a lot of that same care that she gave for her mother to provide, you know, um, to her in that process. So when individuals are adaptively coping, this was really significantly associated with positive um, physical health, the self-reported health from um, the promise measures, um, as well as positive mental health, also from the promise measures. They had um, more perceived um, social support um, if they were adaptively coping. And then the big one is that they have more self-efficacy for controlling upsetting thoughts. And this is the one that I mentioned before that was related. We found a relationship with body mass index that this wasn't the case um, when um, individuals did have a larger body mass index that this capacity for controlling upsetting thoughts was not um, as high. So the work that we're currently doing is we are engaging, uh, um, we actually finished a national caregiver survey where we had about um, almost 200 uh, black family caregivers that participated in this survey. As you can see was uh, maybe a bit different from some other groups is that there's a significant number of people, in fact, more so caring for parents than there are for spouses. And a lot of um, other populations you tend to see um, spouses tend to be the large uh, support group, but here there's a several people taking care of parents. Um, there's also a significant about 9% um, of individuals caring for individuals who are other uh, relatives. Um, and then um, of course the grandparents are in there as well. Um, so this isn't just about either uh, spousal or child caregivers. We also know that this population has a significant amount of hypertension and diabetes, about 40% of the sample were hypertensive and around 30% you know, had um, diabetes. And so it's really important when we think about meeting the educational needs of this group, particularly for the older caregivers that are a part of this group to really be thoughtful about the um, um, education needs that they might um, have about and the importance of self-managing health. Some of the findings that we had was that there was a negative relationship between the IADL. So remember, this was the things like helping with uh, laundry and uh, telephone use, finance, banking, uh, shopping, that sort of thing, um, and adaptive um, coping. Um, and in particular, 
uh, we saw that there was an increased alcohol use when the individual's IADLs were higher, but this was not the case with ADLs. And so what that means is that a couple of things is that ADLs get worse when the um, later in the care trajectory. So by the time that the individual is providing care for somebody who has poor ADLs, they've probably been a caregiver for some time and have gotten used to some of the caregiving responsibilities. Earlier in the disease process as a caregiver, that's when it's most um, stressful and why individuals may be resorting to things like alcohol use and particularly here in Michigan, um, I wouldn't be surprised if we wouldn't see uh, marijuana and other, you know, or particularly marijuana with its um, legality and especially amongst some of our um, younger caregivers that might be participating um, in these sorts of um, care tasks. There's also a negative relationship between um, pain and the positive aspects of caregiving, meaning that individuals who are dealing with chronic pain are not likely to be able to see positive aspects of caregiving. Um, within Black populations, we tend to focus on positive aspects of caregiving rather than caregiver burden because we find that individuals tend to be more amenable to talking about what's positive about the experience rather than verbalizing, you know, um, that it's a burdensome um, experience because um, often um, that's just a cultural difference in which caregiving isn't even though it, it, we can see it checks all the boxes of being burdensome, it's not something that's often culturally acceptable to talk about um, uh, uh, as um, being a burden, you know, talking, saying that taking care of your mother is a burden, you know, it's not something that would be okay to, uh, to openly discuss, which is why I like the support groups in various environments where it is okay to talk about those things is so important. The other thing I think that's really fascinating about this work is that we were able to um, make some connections about these relationships to family caregiving and the need for caregivers to the COVID-19 experience. Um, we know that this has been a really mass disabling event. And um, I think that even though we've sort of gotten sort of um, tired of hearing about it maybe and um, just missed the devastation of it all, one of the things to keep in mind is about 21% of COVID hospitalized patients do require some um, intensive care treatment uh, related to ongoing post-discharge symptoms, which, you know, the list of different types of symptoms that they may have are listed here. And included amongst those symptoms are, of course, memory deficits, confusion, anxiety, depression, the fatigue and weakness, which requires um, family caregiving support in the same ways that you might have to care for somebody that might have a mild cognitive impairment or you know, the earlier uh, stages of dementia where, um, um, but with the added necessary physical support in some instances um, as well. And this can take uh, months to heal from. And sometimes people really don't come back from it following the ICU um, stay. So one of the things that we were able to um, participate in with another study was a qualitative study of um, dyads of individuals who had been discharged from the ICU, who um, were there with a COVID diagnosis along with their family caregiver and completed interviews with them um, using this uh, qualitative uh, descriptive um, design where we essentially, you know, um, evaluated the transcripts of their um, interviews with multiple coders and then evaluated for themes. And so some of the themes that we saw with this, you know, sort of unexpected caregiving was that same things we saw in some of our previous work, engage in support of family and friends. So that support and these support systems are still critical. And that was probably the main thing that made a large difference for individuals to be able to, um, and families to be able to adjust to this new caregiving space, um, increasing their responsibilities to accommodate um, caregiving, meaning the caregiver had to pick up a lot of stuff that they probably weren't having to do before. In some instances, it meant people had to move and they weren't maybe planning on moving. They had to take off from work, sometimes taking off long periods of time for work in order to uh, deal with these new caregiver responsibilities. And something that people don't get to talk about a lot is the emotional toil that it took 
You know, um, I think in COVID, it made a large difference because these individuals were in ICU and doing so poorly. And so some of this has to do with the relief that they are home and survive, but then also the disappointment that they're not the person that they were when they went into the hospital. And this sort of grieving is something that we also don't really address a lot in family caregiving work and talking about this sort of uh, in the hospice world, we call it anticipatory grief or the, um, you know, knowing that you're losing um, somebody, that there's not much that you can do about it, that you've lost the sort of relationship that you've had and trying to adjust to this space that's in the middle that you're in now. Uh, with COVID, what also made um, some differences was managing infection control that we often don't see within dementia and other populations. And then because in some instances, the person may have been improving um, and that you could also see, I think, in the dementia populations is addressing patient independence, meaning there was some family conflict. And we see this in the early stages of dementia, where there's conflict because the person is needing some additional support, but they're not necessarily accepting of that support and maybe feeling as though they can do more than maybe their relative or the person that's able to see what's happening can, you know knows that they can really do. And so trying to find this balance of how do you help somebody and give them help and then prevent like a catastrophe from happening, but also help this individual to maintain their independence and autonomy as much as possible, which is another large area of, um, I think, research that needs to be examined more and getting more of the perspective of individuals that are um, living with dementia and perhaps with more dyadic research. And then finally, this um, idea of how do we engage more support services? How do we, um, this made a difference, a large difference for individuals um, following these hospitalizations um, of their recovery and their adaptation to the caregiver role of being able to be connected with available supports and to get the help that they needed. So what this means overall is that, um, you know, there's an increased development of interventions that include effective um, coping strategies are necessary, thinking more about um, how do we teach and provide information on brain healthy diets. Um, we didn't really talk about smoking here, but um, uh, that was one of the negative um, uh, coping strategies that individuals were frequently using um, in addition to the alcohol use with smoking, um, trying to get, you know, these BMIs down by encouraging a habit of um, exercise and because so many people are turned off by what I call the e-word, thinking about encouraging people to move more um, and thinking about movement. So that could be dance. It could be, you know, but just intentional movement um, and providing some um, healthy coping strategies. We also want to make sure that we're thinking about how to connect caregivers with resources early. And sometimes that means thinking about where these, these caregivers are and who are caregivers. And then finally, I, helping people to really identify who their personal support, social supports are, makes like an incredible difference for all of them. So that's what um, I have. We've got um, a little over 10 minutes, if I can find my um, thing here, so that we can kind of talk a bit about how this is similar or different from your experiences with caregiving, for those of you who are doing some similar work or what questions you might have. I have a question, if I can form this right. When when uh, you presented the graph about caregiving over the lifespan, the the bar chart, is it it do we know do we know the number of of uh, African American and say white or Hispanic individuals living without a caregiver within their area? Is there any data on that? Ah, uh, yes to some extent. So where you can find data on that is there's a couple of places. So the health and retirement study does ask cool. questions about that. Um, the um, Also the National Poll on Healthy Aging asks whether or not the person has a disability um, or not. Um, and it asks whether or not they have a caregiver and there's a caregiver question in there in some of the more recent polls. 
And then also the um, NHATS National Health and Aging Trends um, Study, of course, asked about, um, you know, what the uh, disabilities are of the individual and whether or not they have a caregiver. And then, of course, there's a separate um, national caregiver study for persons who select that they have a caregiver. So there's a few places that you can find out uh, persons who have a disability. The challenge is, um, you know, it's that thing that we talked about, about like, you know, that weird spot where somebody sort of needs care and they saying, no, I don't want it. Like, how do you know that a person with a disability needs a caregiver? Mm. Yep. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Sharia, sure, yeah. thank for the presentation. When when you have um, uh, multiple caregivers, and then in that multiple caregivers you have multiple generations with different views about um, what the next step should be, especially when the person have not described what what that person, what was the directive to do. Mm -hmm. um, how the coping mechanisms and all that to bring those multiple generations, probably or multiple um, caregivers mm -hmm. come into play uh, to have better outcomes for the person that needs the care. Well, I think, so one of the things, there's two things there. So one, even when there's multiple people engaged in care, there's always one person that's the primary caregiver. So the focus of the unit of care is on the individual that needs care and then whoever the primary caregiver is. And so one of the things that often occurs, which, you know, I can be frank, like what happens in my family, because we have a ridiculously huge family. My mother was one of eight and my grandmother was one of 12. So and she had babies from when she was 17 until she was 44. So my family is huge and there's a large generation of folks. So like my cousin who lives here with me in Michigan is like, I don't know, 10 years older than I am. And so, you know, there's a big gap of people that are engaged and interested in care. But my mother was the primary caregiver in Wisconsin. And I had aunts in New Jersey, uncles in California, people in Tennessee, all trying to tell her what she ought to be doing, right? Um, and some of the time they didn't agree because my grandmother told her what she wanted done. And sometimes they didn't necessarily agree with what some of my mom's decisions were. Like, for example, when she went to the nursing home, they were livid, right? But who was coming from California or New Jersey to come and help take care of her <laughs> at home? And the reason she went to the facility is because she broke her um, hip. That's why she went in. And this is like, you know, an example of like this education deficit. We had two of my younger cousins who were in their early 20s over there as caregivers that they sent over there. You know how you get voluntold, like y'all not doing no go, nothing, go over there and help take care of grandma. So it sounded like a good idea, but nobody provided them any training, any support, any information to say what to expect. So they didn't know to like, make sure she's not on the stairs, but the family was livid when they broke her hip. Like you weren't watching her. How could she break her hip? Why did she have to do anything? You know? So it makes it, so, so in answer to your question, you have to focus on the primary caregivers, which, you know, in this instance would have been like my mother. And then it would have been the two people that are physically there providing care. Because what would have happened and what did happen is people were still focused on my mother as the primary caregiver, because she was making sure she got to her appointments, that she had food, et cetera, but she wasn't physically there with her. I had two cousins that were there. And so when we talk about the coping and the education and the training, it means that we have to be thoughtful about like who actually is engaged in care um, and who's doing much of this work and making sure that they have the support that they need. And part of that support that they need is honestly managing the rest of these other folks. And that's something that, you know, we learn to do in end of life care and hospice care as well, because that comes up all the time that, you know, um, in end of life care you have all these people listed as family, but you really need one person. It's often one person that's doing most of the work and other people are just sort of interested parties. Hi, Sharia, great presentation as always. Um, my question relates to sort of gender and culture or, or just cultural norms around gender roles and mm -hmm. aging. Um, for instance, um, if a cultural background really promotes this very, this much more positive view of aging and wisdom, does that create more tension in stepping into caregiving roles? 
um, or or less, and then also just the role of gender and how that might create um, sort of allow some people to be more prepared, but also create much more stress and burden for, say, women. Yeah, well, I, I can say with the gender, it makes a really large role, and I see this across the lifespan. And that uh, men who fall into caregiving role sort of need more affirmation and support um, because um, I think that because there is a cultural norm that this isn't something that that gender does. Um, I've seen that men really struggle when they don't get that sort of pat on the back that, oh, you're doing a fantastic job, you know, um, great job, keep it up. Um, whereas, you know, a lot of women go into this work and because it's expected that you do that, we just sort of go in and you take care of it. And it just is, you know, it's nice to get the extra affirmation. But what I've seen is that for a lot of men, it causes a lot of depression and anxiety, particularly when that um, sort of um, affirm affirmations or affirm that they're doing good stops um, and that it can lead to a lot of um, depression, social isolation and poor, um, general poor outcomes for um, some of these um, men. And that's um, one of the nice things about this work is that in the very beginning, when I was just starting, I did all of these surveys in person with people by hand. And so, and also because I'm a nurse and I'm chatty, you know, our visits used to take forever because they're doing a survey, but then, you know, they haven't had the opportunity to talk to anybody. And so people just really wanted to talk. And that was just so like, you know, that really is one of the things that stood out you know, um, to me um, about that. And the other thing I thought that was interesting, one story in particular was, um, um, and actually it was two things that happened. Women, in two instances, I've met women who were older brides. So these were people who got married later in life to men who were developing dementia. And I suspect that the men knew that they were having some challenges and problems and locked it down, right? Got a caregiver to support them. And the women were just really sort of distraught, if you will, once they realized that what they thought was like maybe more eccentric or, you know, um, and I, I really say that because in both instances, they really sort of thought it was like more like eccentric and sort of fun, spontaneous behavior that they really enjoyed. But once they lived together, they realized like, no, he has dementia. And then, you know, instances where, like I said, these are later marriages where um, there's older kids, the kids don't want to be involved. And so now you have somebody that, you know, their whole life has been disrupted. They're now in a caregiving role um, and really are don't have a lot of support and know where to go. So there's very different sorts of experiences that these caregivers can um, can have that, you know, you know, play a role in both gender as well as uh, what the expectations are of the um, relationship. There is a link in the chat to the eval for today. And we have uh, another minute or two if there's any other questions. Otherwise, like I said, I think I know. Go ahead, Elisa. Sarah. Thank you. Yeah, this was really great. Uh, one of the things I've been thinking about with family supports, and I'm curious what you think is, you know, often you see like respite or um, workplace supports, but I wonder in listening to sort of the stories you've been telling in terms of has anybody ever requested like family counseling or any, you know, does that ever come up in terms of supports that people want? It actually has. Um, I'm not sure within the medical like world how that happens. And so that's something that like in, you know, I've been a, was a hospice nurse for many, many years. And that's something that was a normal part of our care and practice is the family meeting. And so often, like as a nurse, if I go in and see there's a lot of family conflict or the social worker, we would also tell them that that's a service that was available. We can come and talk with your family about what's happening and explain everything. So even in instances where somebody might not be ready for hospice, we could still come in and do a family meeting and talk to them about what was, you know, to come, sort of what they could expect and what services were available. And I see this in dementia care where I feel like I've been on conference calls with people to sort of talk with family about like what to kind of expect and that type of thing. But I don't know that there's an, a, a place that people can really go 
to get this sort of um, support to kind of get on the same page or even if people really realize that it's something that may need to happen. So I think that there's a large gap and a need, you know, in that place. And part of it, I think, has to do with this early diagnostic phase where there's tension between the person who needs support and the family who's wanting to support them and trying to figure out the best way you know, um, to deal with that. Because one of the other things that comes up all the time is driving. What do you do when you have somebody that's, you know, confused? And, you know, like my uncle, you find the car and him in, in Tennessee, and he's supposed to be in Michigan. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. And thank you all for coming today. Um, be sure to put on your calendar the next Leaders Initiative seminar, uh, which will be in March 20th. Um, that will be presented by uh, Dr. Annalise Ramon Filipiak, and she'll be presenting on the return of research results. Um, so mark your calendars for that day and be sure to fill out the evaluation. And I hope everybody has a nice week. See ya.